So I, I don't know if you ever watch award shows like the Academy Awards, and typically with the Academy Awards, they have the awards presented by a duo of two iconic, important actors. And often they choose people that are drawn from very different walks of life, different genres, and you see those two people equally familiar, but um, sort of improbable, maybe improbable, or just interesting as a combination. And you think, what are the circumstances that brought these two iconic but different people to be standing on the same stage at this moment? It's interesting to me sometimes. And in the process of taking the microphone from Isabel Rivera Colazzo and giving it to Carl Elefante, I feel like that, that moment with these two icons, iconic figures in the climate heritage movement um, here with us today, uh, all but standing on the stage together. So Isabel presented on um, archeology span and Carl is going to present on the built environment. Um, um, some of you will know Carl from uh, a phrase he coined, um, the greenest building is the building that's already built. Um, that was though, Carl, tw 20 years ago. Um, and if that's all you know about Carl, it's sort of like only knowing about Picasso's rose period, but not knowing about cubism. Because in the intervening decades, a lot has happened uh, in terms of our understanding of the role of the built environment in sustainability and in climate action. And, and Carl has been on the vanguard of all of that. He's, he's been one of the, uh, our great thinkers on the role of the built environment and the role of architects in sustainability and climate action in embodied carbon and in supply chain carbon and avoided carbon um, and all the key elements that Ken Kimmel described to us as critical to um, climate action. And so we're in for a real treat to have Carl with us today. He's done this work for a long time from uh, uh, as a design principal at the architecture firm Quinn Evans and uh, also recently the president of the American Institute of Architects and now a president emeritus. So Carl, welcome to the stage. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I am planning on talking about some icons. I didn't realize I was one of them. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm not sure I can live up to that. But let me try to get forward here a little bit. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I want to add my thanks to the uh, institutions that have helped make this happen. Uh, it uh, is an enormously important conversation. I've been a resident of Washington for most of my adult life. and. Uh, I'm so thankful for the, to the Smithsonian for stepping up. I, I've seen the Smithsonian step up so many times in so many different ways, uh, and it's really delightful to be associated with it again here. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a change that's going to happen now as we're talking about built heritage, because built heritage is a problem in climate change, that buildings are a cause of climate change. So there's a whole world out there talking about buildings and talking about built heritage as part of the problem, not as part of the solution. And I think that that changes what we have to be thinking about in terms of what we are at, how we are going to advocate for built heritage. Because we actually have to protect it from climate action in a way, both in terms of keeping it from getting washed out to the sea and also to what S, uh, very much along the lines that Isabel was saying, that we have to keep it from being a target of climate action because it's actually contributing carbon into our atmosphere and so on. Uh, so uh, I'm going to first spend a, a, just a second to talk about, you know, let's not take uh, for granted at all the importance of built heritage. Uh, let's learn to be climate literate. Uh, the, the truth of the matter behind the greenest building, uh, recognizing that we actually have this new thing called modern heritage that is a really important part of our heritage, which is easy to ignore because it's, oh, that's that stuff our parents built. We always love the stuff our grandparents did and thought the things our parents did was just uh, a manifestation of ignorance. Uh, and, and, and then uh, ultimately come back to the way that, that Ken did of really how do we take heritage and climate action and really uh, ha have them support each other. 
And I'm going to start this by just giving a little tiny bit of an idea about me. I'm a historic preservation architect. I am just one of the luckiest people in the world because I get to work in places like this. Uh, you know, I mean, come on. You're an architect. You love architecture. You get to work on these sites. It's a dream come true. And I also would confess a little bit about attitudes from really my architectural childhood that shaped me, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even feel it happening. But in a lot of ways, I feel like it kind of shaped the world around me as well. So first icon of my life, Rachel Carson, when I was a kid in architecture school, uh, gosh, we're having an impact on the environment. Uh, the, the second was literally the criminal uh, impact that we were having on our built heritage. And th this is one of my very favorite photos uh, in you know, U.S. Uh, uh, climate advocacy of Philip Johnson and Peggy Guggenheim picketing uh, for the save, saving Penn Station. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, and then last but not least, Jane Jacobs, who really... Uh, brought the sort of human equity equation into really what are we doing with our built environment. So, you know, buildings are important heritage all around the world. There's literally thousands of years of built heritage that we really love and it's dear and it's such an important part of the human story. And there are parts that are ruins, there are parts that are still being used today, the, they were, the way they were built hundreds of years ago. There are parts that are no longer being used the same way, but are still precious to us. Every brick is still precious to us. And then there are really important heritage sites that are constantly evolving. All of that is part of the story of the built heritage. We're in a city of not just built heritage, but intentional built heritage. And I think that that's one of the things that we sort of forget about it, that we're surrounded by buildings that were built to tell a story, not just that there's a kind of historical perspective, but they're frankly propaganda. They're trying to tell us things about our culture that we were supposed to not miss. You know, that's why they built them that way. And heritage in the, built in, in the built environment with buildings and structures is really changing. And the story of the, uh, you know, creating the whole story, telling the whole story, is becoming important. Go to Mount Vernon today and see George Washington, the biggest whiskey maker in the country. Uh, that story is being told. George Washington is someone who enslaved hundreds of people. That's a story that's being told. And then there are also many, many types of built heritage, some things that we can really take for granted. Uh, the, the, the photo on the top left there is actually the Macmillan sand filters. You know, so our water system is actually part of our built heritage. Uh, whose stories are we telling? Uh, this is the first African-American gold medalist and his work uh, uh, Paul Revere Williams. And by the way, on the, on the lower right there is Langston Terrace right here in Washington, D.C., uh, built by an African-American AIA gold medalist. Uh, and as I said before, the sort of evolving heritage and recent heritage in the building sector is increasingly important. Is built heritage threatened by climate change? Uh, actually, Ken did a wonderful job of, of uh, making it very clear that this is the case. Uh, catastrophic fires, catastrophic storms, flooding from normal storms, flooding from super storms. Uh, bottom right there is a photograph from Annapolis, whose uh, what daylight, sunny day flooding, as it's called, no, no explanation from a storm. Annapolis has gone from having sunny day flooding two, three, four, five times a year to over 50 times a year. It's all about sea level rise. There's no other explanation. So, okay, buildings are heritage, no doubt about it. The pedigree is there. Uh, but we now need to learn the language of climate and climate action if we are going to defend that heritage. We have to become part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We have to talk the language of decarbonization. And I'm going to spend about five minutes. I'm just going to sort of throw it at you. I don't expect you to understand it. But let's get the vocabulary. Let's become literate in this because it's very important part of us being able to defend our, our built heritage. 
as I said at the opening, of these six categories, the six typologies that Andrew talked about, with the exception of museums that I see as buildings, uh, buildings are the version of this heritage that's actually part of the problem. Our buildings are today, our heritage buildings, many of them today, are actually causing climate change. We have to go from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. And I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail. Um, so the Paris Agreement came and went. Uh, we have these uh, uh, you know, targets that were talked about. And, and uh, let me just add to that by saying that what does this mean in the building sector? It means these four types of actions. We need to be using green power. Buildings need power. Even when we make it very efficient buildings, they still need power. We must get buildings unaddicted to fossil fuels. Uh, the, the carbon, how we design buildings to get carbon out of it, how we renovate buildings to get carbon out of it, and then ultimately what's called the embodied carbon, the carbon that's in the buildings because of how we make them and what we make them out of. And that actually is probably the hardest of these four actions to really get to the bottom of and to really get full control of. Uh, I would just remind us all that this is parallel to a much larger agenda in our world. Is the only thing that we need to do in our world is to get the carbon out of it? Are there any other problems that maybe we would want to solve at the same time? Uh, you know, maybe kind of poverty and conflict and hunger and injustice. We are going to modify everything we do in order for climate action. We are going to do it everywhere in the world. Well, if we're going to do everything, everywhere, isn't everyone just inevitable? So let's be thinking about the everyone part of climate action, because that is, I think, the thing will really stimulate people to say, oh yes, it's about my life, it's about the things that I care about. Uh, so let's get to the everyone part of this. And I'm the architect, I'm talking about people, I'm gonna get fired talking about people, I'm just supposed to talk about bricks and concrete and stuff. So uh, buildings are uh, th themselves something that can be thought about in terms of that global uh, justice and equity and, and security agenda, that buildings can actually generate green power. They can sequester carbon. They can actually provide water by harvesting water. And we saw some traditional things that Isabel showed us. Buildings must be thought of as not just part of our heritage, but part of the solution to not just climate change, but the social and economic and environmental challenges that we, that we face, and, and they can. Now, very quickly, 101 of how we get from carbon crisis to carbon solution and what it means about the building stock and built heritage. Uh, so actually, uh, Dr. Kimmel talked about this. Uh, I'm gonna use a, a slightly different terms because uh, we love counting things in, in the architectural world. So we have a budget of 500 gigatons of CO2. That's it, we only get to spend that much of it if we have a 50% chance of not completely screwing up everything, okay? Well, that's not a very good chance, right? Wouldn't we like to like improve the odds a little? So we have a 300, 340 gigaton budget to have a two-thirds chance of not having everything be completely screwed up. So let's at least push that to the 1.5, to the let's, let's try to do a little better, then maybe it will work. So if we do that, we can't just follow a straight line. We have to be more immediate, we have to be more urgent. We have to force this to happen very quickly, very deeply, or we won't get the job done. Uh, somehow or another, we've got to pull that curve down. The straight line doesn't work. We have to aim it down faster. We have to make deeper changes more quickly. And I can tell you that in the architectural profession, we talk about 2030 and 2040. 2050 is too far away. Our impact is too little too late if we're talking 2040. What can we do by 2030? What can we do by 2040? 
Uh, so the diagram has to look more like this and less like the straight line. Um, just a little bit of, well, my goodness, that's crazy. There's no way we can ever do it. If we can just stop using coal to generate power, if we can have all electric buildings by 2030, and if we can get the carbon out of concrete, if we can do those three things by 2030, we're almost getting to that target of the quick declines. So again, the, the, the technology is there. We know what we need to do. We just have to get up and get it done and, and really create the pressure for the political will to make it happen. Uh, so buildings, how do buildings figure into this and, and where does built heritage fit into this? Uh, we need to become uh, literate of uh, these greenhouse gas emission numbers. Buildings in their operation globally are 28% of the current uh, carbon footprint. Uh, what we make our buildings out of is another 11%. And let me just also add, so what are buildings mostly made out of? Concrete, steel, glass, aluminum. If you take just those materials and you say, we are going to solve those materials because that's what we make our buildings out of, it's not just the 11% of buildings that will change, we'll get another 11% for other industrial uses of concrete, steel, aluminum, and glass. So if you take those all together, just thinking about the built environment, that's 39%. And then if you throw in the come along of another 11%, literally half the climate footprint that we're looking at, half the carbon footprint that we're looking at, we can get if we think about getting the built environment right. So I think half of it's important and we ought to pay attention to it. Uh, I think it is. So let's talk about the greenest building and uh, where is, uh, in a lot of ways, kind of the wisdom that we as building conservators have and how do we contribute that to solving that 50% of the carbon footprint. And the first is I want to show you the greenest building in the world. Uh, the greenest building in the world, it's in Amsterdam, of course. And it's, this build, and it's this building called the Edge. And this has got every technological bell and whistle on it. You actually literally wear a biofeedback badge. like It's almost like your Apple Watch. When you walk in the building, it knows who you are. It says good morning to you. It knows what temperature you want the rooms to be and so on. Really? Really? That's the greenest building in the world? That, that everything is like you don't even have to be a person. It tells you when to breathe. You know, really? That's our solution to everything? That, that the machines are going to tell us how to get it right? I actually think this is the greenest building in the world. And this is right here in Washington, D.C. Montgomery Meigs was the uh, architect for it. Uh, uh, he spent many years fighting with uh, Thomas Walter about who should get credit for the Capitol Dome. Uh, this building is this gigantic uh, passive ventilation system. Uh, that is the modern workplace of 1880. Uh, so to me, I'm, I'm kind of almost overemphasizing this, that built heritage has something to teach us about the future. You know, the, the ancient's knowledge is uh, the wisdom of the future. In the building sector, we need to, to tap into that as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't trust machines. I think the machines should be allowed to shut things down, but never allowed to turn things on. If you want a light, go turn it on. If you want air conditioning, go turn it on. I want the machine to say, hey, you left the room, you forgot to turn the light out. I don't want the machine telling me that I like it 72 degrees. If I'm too hot, take off your sweater. Um, okay, I'll get off the soapbox for a minute. <laughs> Uh, maybe I won't. <laughs> so uh, let, let's also get our arms around what is our built heritage and what are the situations that we're, we have to interject ourselves with. And I want to credit Ed Masaria from Architecture 2030 for having the ability to uh, just say things simply. These are our cities. They exist everywhere around the world. You could take pictures of cities from almost any country and they'll almost all look the same. And they are characterized by two things. This is the modern world that's been created over the last 75 years. This is what we're dealing with. 
And it includes mountains of buildings in its core, surrounded by carpets of buildings. And the solutions for the mountains and the carpets are completely different. And we have to understand that this is not a one-size-fits-all. Interestingly, in almost every city, the mountains are about 50% of the carbon footprint, and the carpet is the other 50%. So both are equally important for us to get right and understand how to work with them. The greenest building is the one that's already built, and thank you to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Preservation Green Lab, for still doing the only really authoritative study on this. But I want to just shift gears a little and say, you know, part of what we need to adopt is really a vocabulary of the life cycle of buildings. Buildings are enormously durable, but they need love. They need attention over time. And there's some attention that they need every five years. There's some attention that we need every 50 years. The photos that I showed you of the kind of a major historic building intervention work that we do at Quinn Evans as a preservation architect. It's about a 50-year uh, intervention cycle, that a building needs substantial capital reinvestment about every 50 years, or it does something like fall down. Um, and I just would also just say a little reassuringly, there's a lot of really wonderful tools that allow us to really get into the nitty gritty of this. We don't have to be afraid of it. This is a place where the machines can help us out and do all these calculations and stuff for us and, and really quantify things to give us a really solid sense about what we need to do and, and what a better solution work looks like. Um, uh, I, I want us to recognize that every building matters. When we drive by a building like this, we rightfully look at it and say, that's blight. That's a bad thing in my, I don't want that in my neighborhood. But the solution to that building is to not tear it down. It is not to throw it out. It's to fall in love with it and figure out what to do with it. And the developer who took this building on her vision of this building when she saw that was, oh, art plus green equals cool. <laughs> was that the thought that you had when you looked at that building? Uh, so we have to be visionaries. And this is that, this is that same building today. It's part of the Harlem Renaissance era of Detroit, Michigan. It's part of the story of Detroit's rising African-American population at a time when they were coming to Detroit to have good jobs in the auto industry, and it was a, it was a magnet for African Americans coming from the South to have a better life. That story of uh, the the glory of a period of time in Detroit, Michigan, which we're not really thinking much about its glory these days, that story can be told by this building's heritage. It can't be told by tearing this building down and replacing it with a 40-story condo. And guess what? We greened the bejeebers out of this building. Uh, and it is a, a near net zero energy building. There's a solar array, actually with a highly innovative solar technology on the roof. It's a whole other thing I could talk about with a ground source heat pump. We actually didn't have any land, but we needed land for a, a, a well field for a ground source. We actually got a lease on public ground so we could actually have a well field next to our building that didn't have a site. Uh, so this is uh, a statistic, this is statistics from the commercial building stock, institutional building stock, this is kind of what, what I know, this is where I work in. And, and uh, let me just, I wanna point out a little bit about the colors here. So this is our building stock as kept by the uh, US Information Agency. The green are the projected growth between now and 2060. The building stock in the US is projected to double in the next 40 years, double. So I, I want two important facts for you to get from this chart. One is that today, the existing building stock is 100% of the building stock. <laughs> okay, we, the existing building, we, there, are, it's, there are a lot of them. There are millions and millions of square feet of them, billions and billions. 324 billion square feet of building in this country today. We can't ignore it. We're not gonna solve the problem by the green bars here. We're gonna solve the problem by the green bars and all the other bars. And what are those other bars? 
Well, the orange, the first, the first couple, are the pre-World War II buildings, where that's what we consider our, our built heritage challenge, right? They're all in that, they're all, that, that's where Mount Vernon is. It's in one of, those, one of those bars. Most of the Smithsonian museums are in one of those bars, but not all of them. A bunch of them are in these blue bars. So two-thirds of the existing building stock are buildings from the modern era that were uh, completely different in how they were built and designed. I mean, Ashley talked about Farnsworth House and how different that was. Well, from a climate point of view, from this challenge that we're faced with today, what characterizes those buildings? Well, they're built out of much more ephemeral materials, much harder to maintain, uh, needing much more aggressive life cycle interventions in a 40 or 50 year period. They're all absolutely addicted to fossil fuels. Most of them you can't open a window in. Uh, if you unplug it, it becomes uninhabitable. How silly is that to design a building that if you unplug it from its addiction to fossil fuels, it's uninhabitable? I, I don't get it. How did, we ever, how did we ever get to that as a way to build a building? Well, two thirds of our buildings are built that way. We have to figure out how to work with them. And as Farnsworth House showed, it's an important part of our heritage. The American era is represented by this era of buildings. This is our heritage that we are uh, the stewards of today. So the modern era building, we have to get our arms around how to deal with modern heritage and how to deal with these modern era buildings. They're very different. They're much bigger. They're the mountains. Uh, they're made out of completely different materials. There's been a lot of talk about just how bad they are. And, you know, well, who cares about them anyhow? It's just those modern, you know, glass things. Um, and I would just point to uh, another Quinn Evans project, but also another Smithsonian project. Look at the tender, loving care that's going into the rebirth of the Air and Space Museum now. You know, that is what it means to care for modern heritage. Uh, this is another example of what's happening with modern heritage. This is the Penn Station of the modern era building stock. 270 Park Avenue is being demolished as we speak. It's the largest building ever demolished intentionally. The World Trade Center was the largest building ever demolished unintentionally, except there were a few people who it was their intent. But we're tearing down 50-story buildings to build 90-story buildings. That must stop. That's not OK. And it's mostly not OK from a climate action standpoint. We can't afford to be that wasteful with our building stock. And I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but just to say that there are interventions. There are a whole variety of interventions that we can have. On the right is Lever House you are not seeing a single piece of original material in that photo, but it looks exactly the same as the building that was, that was originally built. It is considered to be historically significant, so it looks the same, but there's no material integrity to it at all. The middle building is one where all the, all the uh, original material still there. It's just been overclad with a glass facade, so it's got a double facade to it. And then the third building, which is also uh, on, on the left there, also new material, but it has been uh, uh, reimagined so that it has climate responsive design in it. So anyway, there's a lot of different ways that we can deal with that building stock. Um, very simplistically, we have to understand that buildings are both operational carbon and embodied carbon. Both of them are footprints. With existing buildings, the embodied carbon, that was already spent in the past. Well, does that matter? Well, kind of not, you know, because it's history now. We're, we're worried about moving forward, but, well, what are we doing moving forward? Most of what you will hear people talk about moving forward is about reducing operational carbon. And we want to reduce it by 80%. That's sort of the goal, that if we can take the kind of business as usual, and reduce operational carbon to 80 by 80% down to 20% of the existing footprint, we can close the gap with renewable. And, and uh, I can say as a practicing architect, that's not outrageous. We, we can do that. So what that means for 
uh, renewal of existing buildings is that we recognize that there will be this time, and the time is now, when we need to reinvest in these buildings, bring down their operational carbon. We've got to bring down the operational carbon. How do we do that? We have to spend new embodied carbon to get there. Well, the delta, the green box here, is our goal. In the end, in a 10-year or 20-year or 30-year period, we want that action of intervening with the building, making it more energy efficient, uh, to yield us a net result of avoided carbon. We have to figure out how to actionize that, and we also have to figure out how to, how to put dollars to it. And I'll just show you a real quick example. This is a project that we did in Detroit. A typical building like this is just another ho-hum 20-story building. There's not a lot of uh, special story here other than to say that, you know, it's a viable building. And it's got a structural frame. It's got the outside enclosure, you know, the skin of the building. And then this building, we're literally taking it from an office building and creating it as housing. So all the stuff on the inside is being turned from office building to housing. Uh, well, you know, gosh, that seems like an awful lot of work. All you're keeping is the sort of the structural frame of the building. Well, this gives you an idea of how important that is, that it extends the capture rate of the, of the reduced operational carbon. It goes from over a 20-year capture period down to a six-year capture period just by keeping the steel frame of that building. That's how much embodied energy is in that building. So the teardown scenario, replace this with another building, has a, a, more than a three times longer payback. Is that a good plan? No, that's not a good plan. We have to learn how to keep our buildings. And even if it just means keeping the concrete frame or the steel frame, let's at least do that. It matters. It, it has a tremendous impact. Now, I, I'm going to... Uh, close now and talk about the actions. I don't want to come back to those, uh, those models. So what do we need to do to have heritage in the building sector be part of climate action? Well, number one, get, let's get the data. Let's be able to speak data speak. If we can't, we won't be part of the conversation. That's the conversation that's happening. Uh, let's be advocates. And there's this guy here, this Andrew somebody. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, in the, whatever field you're in, you're part of the, the, the impacts, be part of the solution. Show people how your concerns actually articulate an aspect of climate threat and an aspect of climate action. Every one of us has the opportunity to do it. Let's not accept uh, that uh, buildings that are, are unlovable can't be loved. Let's find a way to love every building that's out there. It matters. There are people whose job it is to try to tear those buildings down. It has to be our job to love them and give them new life. And it's probably in most cities, you'll find that there's two categories that are being tracked by the city. The first is uh, the abandoned buildings and the cities keep lists of abandoned empty buildings. But they're actually really terrible at this second category, and that is under-occupied buildings. And our goal has to be to occupy every square feet of every building in town. You know who is keeping track of these? The real estate brokers. So we have to engage them and help us figure out not just to address abandoned buildings, but also underutilized buildings. Uh, what is a way that we want to grow our buildings? You know, our historic neighborhoods and our historic buildings can grow. They can be part of the densification solution. Uh, I didn't actually make that one on the right up. That's a real building. It actually exists. Uh, is that it? Is that our solution, that we want to have buildings that look like insects infecting other buildings? Uh, <clears throat> but I would say that as an architect, I don't want to be a Luddite about it, we, we have problem buildings. You know, the Boston City Hall, which was the coolest, most important building when I was in architecture school. Oh, the, the mayor, a couple of mayors ago, is like, this is terrible, we gotta tear this piece of junk down. And the local architectural community said, 
uh, let's look at some creative ways. And they got four uh, emerging architecture firms, all of which had been in business for less than five years. And they said, okay, here's $5,000. Go brainstorm on what we could do with Boston City Hall. And they came up with incredibly interesting uh, and creative ideas. It's not binary. There aren't just two choices. You know, let's figure out the choices that are going to work. And as a, 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 a heritage building advocate, um, let's recognize the power of the things that we've cared about and them as models for climate change advocacy. So the economic model of heritage conservation is a really, really good model for us to be looking at for climate action and what we could do to incentivize climate action. Uh, the, for us to talk about this as economic opportunity, we have to do that. Uh, you know, Dr. Kimmel mentioned the jobs. You know, you, you should know the jobs impact of every single thing you're talking about anytime you walk in a room. If you can talk about that, all of a sudden you're, you're a hero. Uh, and so there's, there are $200 trillion challenges facing the world right now. One is the restorative challenge that we've got stuff, bridges that are falling down, et cetera. We've got a hundred trillion dollar backlog of deferred maintenance in the world. We also have a hundred trillion dollar challenge to decarbonize the building sector and to decarbonize the other economic sectors. Two hundred trillion dollar challenges? Sounds like there's a lot of jobs involved with that. And I'll just close by saying, Urgent action is not something that just happened to us in the 21st century. There have been other times when ur urgent action was needed. Uh, in, the, in the 19th century, infectious disease was rampant in every city in the country uh, and was literally killing people. So two, you know, two thirds of the deaths in New York City in 1880 you know, were, were from th this preventable situation. What did we do? We changed the built environment to get rid of those conditions. It wasn't until 1940 that the medical solution of penicillin was available to the general public. We changed circumstances to address the urgent action. We reinvented what buildings looked like. Uh, and we did it by not just motivating everybody that they didn't have to be scared about infectious disease anymore, but they could be excited and inspired to create beautiful, wonderful cities. So let's bring the, the carbon challenge and the equity and uh, inclusion challenge of our societies together and solve them both together. We can't do it separately. And I just want to say I'm a protector of highly, highly valued historic buildings. That's what I get to do. So lucky. And well, what's that got to do with climate action? We have to find a way of protecting buildings like this to also be part of climate action. You know, so here are, here's the photovoltaic array that we included in that incredibly gorgeous heritage building. We have to find ways of doing that. And I want to just end by saying, you know, let's change our attitudes. And I was a kid when John Kennedy got inaugurated as president. And Everybody always talks about the ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That part of his speech actually started this way, and I think this is the relevant words that he has for us today. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. We need to welcome this responsibility to respond to climate change and make the world a better place from doing it. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today.